Welcome to Audacity Works, a podcast inspired by and dedicated to the working artist, the creative entrepreneur, and generally doing the damn thing. This exists on the premise that the world belongs to those who have the audacity to believe that their lives have value. This is for you. Hi, friends, and welcome to Audacity Works. Before we dive into the main episode, I just wanted to give you a heads up that if you have been interested in the two-hour webinar with veteran artist Lexa Walsh called How'd You Get That Awesome Residency, it is happening tomorrow, August 8th, from 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. There'll be a link for that in the show notes. And Lexa sent me the slides for it this morning. I'm like, oh shit, this is gonna be the tits because it's just really, really good information. And I so wish that I had this information three years ago when I started looking into artist residencies. So I'm thrilled to share that with y'all. Um, if it is useful to you, I hope that you'll come. I hope you enjoy. Other than that, happy August. Also, if you're down here with me in the dirty south, hope that your yard is not flooded too badly from Tropical Storm Debbie. Ours has several ponds, but, you know, we're okay. We're safe. This is proof of life. I'm recording this tiny little message uh, the day before, Tuesday, August 6th. So, we're all good over here. So, don't forget to check the show notes after for, uh, there's a link to Veronica's press kit that we talk about in the episode, and I'm just uh, really pleased to have brought her on. We met through the Audacity Project several years ago, and I just have wanted to bring her on because she makes things out of nothing and then tours them. And I'm very interested in talking to people who are making things and finding out what their process is, and that's what she shares with us. So do enjoy. Welcome to Audacity Works. I am your host, Rachel Strickland, and this is episode number 93, and I have with me in the studio, Veronica Rosas, who is also known as La Bruja Creative, and runs a theater company uh, called the Theater of Mutiny, which we're definitely going to talk about. She's an award-winning director, producer, choreographer, and coach. Frustrated with the state of things, she wrote a show and started a theater, com theater company. In 2023, the show premiered at San Diego International Fringe Festival last year and won Best Ensemble Show, and is currently doing rounds at the Ren Fair at Ren Fairs. Is this correct? Yes. Welcome. I'm so yeah. glad to see you. Hi. You guys I'm can't so see happy her. To see you too. I can only <laughs> see her. Um, I've been watching the creation of your show and watching it grow its legs and walk around uh, with great delight and interest. Uh, so I would love to know about uh, the process of creating it. Uh, it says you were frustrated with the state of things. So can we start with the frustration? Yeah. Um, great. <laughs> um, well, I, I think it's part of living in, I, I don't know how the rest of the world is, but in LA, like, there are so many people that will just work for nothing because they just want to be seen. They think, well, we got to work for nothing and then we'll work for something. And so it was very frustrating to like, look at all of these um, auditions that were no pay, no pay, no pay. So my goal was to be able to pay people. <laughs> um, and How revolutionary. I, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and I love Renaissance fairs and my dream forever was to be an act at, at Renaissance fairs. So I wrote a show specifically with the goal in mind to, to do Renaissance fairs. That was so cool. <laughs> Did you just, yeah. okay. So and is then, the process of you writing this script, was it kind of um like Kerouac where you just shut yourself in a room for a day and smoked a bunch of cigarettes and wrote a play or <laughs> that, yeah, no, that's exactly it... what it was <laughs> really no <laughs> okay no i've been writing it and revising it since 2019 i i started in 2019 i kind of workshopped it with a group of friends um like outside in parks during pandemic times and then it went away and then in 2020 
two, I got a group together again and I found a director and we were going to do it this time. And then I really felt like the director didn't get what I was trying to do. And Mm -hmm. I told him that and I kind of told him like we had a longer conversation about it. And then we went back to rehearsal and anytime he'd give a stage direction, then he'd look at me and be like, is that okay? And I was like, that's not what I want either. Like, I don't want, (laughs) like, if you're going to direct it, you know? So again, I like was like, I I don't think this is the right time for this. I have a lot of other things going on. I'm just going to leave it alone for a while again. Um, And then at the end of 2022, my partner at the time was just like, well, why don't you just direct it yourself? Like you clearly know what it is you want. Why don't, why don't you just direct it? Um, and I was like, I don't know. I don't direct things. <laughs> um, but I did. And I, I mean, it went well. Sometimes I, I mean, a lot of times I'd feel like, I don't know if I know what I'm doing. And I had somebody in the cast at the time who's no longer with the cast, but she had started with this, with this other director and told me like, well, I don't think it's going to be good without him. I don't really think it's going to be funny. Ouchie. (laughs) Well, we fucking won at the French Festival, so whatever. (laughs) Let me wipe my tears with my award for best ensemble. That's got to be a competitive category. (laughs) Yeah, well, there is also a lot of one-person shows, too, Mm -hmm. which I was was surprised by. Uh, Oh, God. Uh, one person shows they're so self indulgent and all this stuff, and then I watched them all and was like, "Fuck, I gotta create a one person show." Like, oh, (laughs) I actually really want to do this. No, I love a one person show. Honestly, just to see someone's essence boiled down like that, Mm, so inspiring. Mm -hmm. So your show has a cast of four, including you. Is that right? Yes, including me. Right. And tell us, tell us about the show. It is a Shakespeare speed run (laughs) and it focuses on all of the ways people die in Shakespeare's tragedies. And it's me and a male actor are the two narrators. And there's like a lot of like banter between us as we try to tell the stories. And I love Shakespeare and he knows nothing about Shakespeare. Um, (laughs) And then there's two actors who like mine they're they're clowning the whole time they act out everything that we're doing and they do all the deaths and they change hats and costumes and play all the characters and it's two um it's two women that are playing all these male characters there's a lot of sword dicks and and so much (laughs) yeah sword dicks are you are there dildos involved they're the closest we get to something that looks like a dildo is a baguette oh fantastic Okay. Yeah. <laughs> is there sword fighting with the baguette? No, there's a there's a blowjob though. The baguette. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I want to see this play so bad. And I don't even really like plays that much. I mean, I like them when my friends make them, but like traditional <laughs> theater uh hasn't yeah. really captured my imagination which is kind of perfect mm-hmm. because you made this play for people who don't like plays yes i has all, i feel like theater in the traditional sense is kind of dying and if we want to keep making live theater interesting to people we have to change the way we approach it um and so that's what kind of the goal of the company is is to to change the way live theater works and what we do with it. I love that. So you you started this because you were frustrated and originally you were like, Oh, I want to be able to pay the cast. I want to create a paying opportunity for other Mm -hmm. performing artists, actors. So here's my play. We're going to put on a show. How did you handle the financial aspect? Because we're American. Yeah, and yeah, there's um, funding, but there's not much of it. No, there's not. Uh, <laughs> we crowdfunded. Mm-hmm. And then we also got two kind of like micro grants that were under 
both of them were under 3000 so we got, mm -hmm. we crowdfunded about half of it and then we got grants for the other half. That's amazing. Yeah. So uh, did you have a, sorry, you can tell I haven't um, created a show in a while. So I'm like, did you know how much it was going to cost ahead of time? Did you have a budget written out and your eyes set on uh, the San Diego fringe? Yes, a mm -hmm. little bit. It definitely ended up costing more than we had expected mm -hmm. originally, especially with um, the amount of props and costumes that were in the show. Mm -hmm. uh, it was it just constantly, what's, well, we need this now and we need this and we need this. So that was, that was the biggest cost, uh, costuming but we did we did have a budget yeah we had mm -hmm. a budget but we definitely ended up being way over budget do you know by what percentage do you have any idea probably by about a thousand dollars so it, it was it was costumes and then also um making sure they had travel stipends to get out to san diego too okay the only reason i'm asking such a boring question is so that um so that the people who are listening who are like, oh, I want to make a show and I want to hear mm -hmm. about what that process is like. So we can tell them to add like 20% yeah. to their budget. <laughs> yeah. You reckon that would have done it? 20%? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's always yeah. a thing. And then there's other things that, uh-huh. Yeah. And we, we took into account things that just everything ends up being more like advertising ended up being more than we had expected. And yeah. Well, I have made a couple of shows, but I didn't make budgets for them beforehand. I have mm -hmm. done things in reverse order, which was, I can tell you what the budget for the thing is after I've already finished making it, because then I have a spreadsheet, like, this is what it costs. <laughs> yeah. But in the meantime, I'm like, let's take a stab at it. I don't know. <laughs> Your way sounds like uh, less of a panic. And hence yeah. why people have budgets. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How did you cast it? I did a couple years as a scare actor at Universal Studios. And mm. they were all scare actors. Like, they're great with physicality. They can't speak as, as when you're in the role. So they're, and they're all like monsters and have to move weird and be physical. And that's how you communicate. Um, so it worked really well as <laughs> finding those people because that's what I needed. Um, yeah, so we are we all d d we're scare actors together at Universal Studios. So what are some of the roles you've had as a scare actor? Uh, I was La Llorona. Oh, um, of course you were the darling. last the last year, and um, and then I filled in as Rat Girl a few times that year as well, which was fun. Uh, yeah, that that was the most fun I've had because I was a rat and I had this little <laughs> skull on my shoulder and I ran around with a knife. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a dead thing and a knife. It was great. And do people ever get aggressive with you in the in the haunted house? Yeah, that's why I stopped doing it. Oh, really? Yeah. Was, uh, when I was La Llorona, I'm, I was out in the street. So we weren't in the, the the houses. Basically, people could get as close to us as they wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, and when you're a ghost that's supposed to be walking around really slowly and elegantly in mourning, it gives people a lot of time to think, how can I fuck with that person? Oh, God. Um, yeah. And we had other cast out there with us that were did their best to like keep an eye on us and and stay near to us, but doesn't always work. Okay. Yeah. I want to ask more questions, but I also feel like that's just me being nosy <laughs> and wanting to know what the last straw was. Oh, these there were these two guys that cornered me. Oh no. Like put their arms out to stop me so I couldn't move. And 
security was awful and didn't help and didn't really watch us or do anything about things. And that was when I was like, I'm not doing this role anymore. You're going to have to put me somewhere else. And then, then I started filling in just as rad girls. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm sorry that happened to you and even more sorry that uh, nobody fucking did anything about it. Yeah. Performing arts uh -huh. with the public. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'd be a lot of fun if the public wasn't there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, you guys can't see this, but Veronica has a coffee cup that says maybe today Satan. And I just think everyone needs to know that. <laughs> it's very good. <laughs> so from from the moment of deciding I'm gonna make this show to the uh premiere, how long was that timeline? Mm -hmm for you we well i started writing it in 2019 right. and we did fringe in april of 2023 but we started rehearsing um i think in like january of 2023 so that was actually like from the start of rehearsals with the cast that we and the director that we were working with to to mm -hmm. actually putting it up at San Diego, we started in in January. So four months prep time, but years yeah. cooking in the oven. Yeah, I'm always interested to know how long something has cooked because I I need things to cook for a very long time before they claw, claw their way up from the depths. Mm -hmm. That seems like a pretty tidy amount of time. 2019 to yeah. 2023. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm glad that it it took that long just because I I mean, I don't think I have the script the way it started or the, and definitely like the cast too and the way that vision changed for me. Um, but I'm I'm really glad it took that long just because it wouldn't have been the same show if I had done it earlier. Mhm. Mm so it was good that you had, that you waited and let it cook some more. Yeah. Yeah, that's so important. Mm -hmm. What else can you tell us about the creation process? Um, it's especially when you're the person in charge of the thing. I think it's it's lonely and like there's a lot of. I mean, for me, anyways, there is a lot of self doubt of like there were just so many things that came up like that we could have just folded, you know, and decided, okay, this isn't going to work. And maybe next time. And, you know, there were so many opportunities um, for us to, to stop. And it was up to me to, to find a way to keep going. Mm -hmm. So it's like this, you kind of have this responsibility to this, thing you decided to make and that's lonely because nobody else uh, even even though you have a cast and you know people are excited about it nobody else is going to help you when things fall apart you know you have to figure that out on your own mm -hmm. but it did like really prove to me that I could it made me feel like oh you could do whatever you want like if you want to, if you, you want to do something, you're going to figure out a way to do it. And it did teach me that too. That's nice. That's yeah. so nice to hear. Because <laughs> I've been talking a lot on the podcast about how confidence rarely comes before you do a thing. It, mm -hmm. it comes after. So you can't wait to feel confident. You just have to yeah. do the thing. Yeah. And I didn't know, I, I mean, I know how to write and I know how to act but I didn't know how to do any of the other things before doing the show. I just decided I want to do this thing and I figured everything out as I went. I figured out how to crowdfund and I researched and learned like the ways to make it successful. And I looked into how to write grants and how do you make a press kit after because we need to submit to Renaissance fairs and yeah. You just 
if you want it enough, you'll figure it out. I love that. What, if anything, uh, is a factor that really increased uh, the value of the show, made it successful? I think my cast, like, and the way I chose to cast it. When I was working on it with friends over the pandemic, the two people who were clowning were men. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I was like, no, you know what? I I think I want it to be to be women because when it's men and they're playing women, women become the joke. And when you cast it as as two women, then all the male characters become the joke. And I think that's what, like, set the tone of the show. Yeah. Punching up. Yeah. I love that. And that took so many iterations, um, like when you were just workshopping it over the pandemic to come to that realization. Mm -hmm. That's so cool. And the, 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 the people that I have cast were they're also so they're so funny and they're so wonderful like every rehearsal even now we always get together and do pickup rehearsals and every time we find new things because we're all willing to play with it and and they're continuing to like improvise and find new things and we make each other laugh so much so there's always new things just because I give them a lot of freedom to like create the character how they want to make it and find moments for themselves where they want to find them. So I think it's also like a creative rewarding process. Yeah. It sounds a lot more fun to be put off leash. You're like, go be yourself. Yeah. (laughs) And play. God, that sounds fun. Yeah. Now there's, um, I don't think we have mentioned yet. The title of the show is 79 Ways to Die. Yes, 79 Ways to Die. And there's several like versions. There's the stage version, which is meant to be in mm-hmm. like in a traditional theatrical venue. And then there's the fair version, of mm-hmm. which there are two. It, just correct me where I'm wrong. The kids version and the grown-up version, which I assume is the one with yes. the baguette. <laughs> Yeah, we have a more family-friendly version, but the first uh, fair we got a contract for asked us to perform in the beer garden, and it was like, "You want to do an adult show?" So we were like, "Yeah, how much? Ma- how many dicks can we stick in the show?" So that's <laughs> how many dicks did you stick in the show? <laughs> one of our, yeah, one of one of our our uh, performers. Her name is Audrey, and. She plays Romeo, but it, the ongoing joke is that, like, as often as she can, she will find a way to make something into a dick. <laughs> and I, I think she's very happy with it. <laughs> she sounds like a treasure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm glad that you have her. I couldn't imagine this show without her. She's amazing. <laughs> so um, <laughs> where where is it coming next? We're going to be at the Curtis Theater in Brea, in Orange County, August 18th. And it's part of this Female Playwrights Festival. Amazing. All right. Um, I'll get a link from you for that yeah. if I can't find it on my own. And so y'all just check the show notes if you're in the Southern California. Go see mm-hmm. all of the plays by the Female Playwrights and. Oh, that's so cool. (laughs) I love it. How many shows do you do a day at the Ren Fair? Okay. They're 25 minute shows. So we're not doing our full, it's like an hour and 15 when we do the full show. Oh, we're just doing 25. Yeah. The first few that the fairs we've been doing, what we do is we cut the show up into like three different parts so that we still do the whole show and it's a different one every time um but we are starting to learn like oh these are the the shows that really hit these are all clearly people's favorites so i think in the future when we do fairs we're going to keep it to the ones that everybody likes the most how do you decide what to cut 
you just experiment and see how it lands with the audience? Yeah. 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 So we were doing, we cut it up like, okay, we're going to do these three shows at the first show and then two and then two at the, you know, and we have three shows. So we still are doing the full show just split up throughout the day. Mm -hmm. Um, But we did learn, we've been learning what people's favorites are just by the reactions to the audience and the size of the audience and the reactions of the audience. Um, So I think we're going to change it next time to being just those ones that are clearly everyone's favorites. And are the favorites part of the adult version or the family friendly iteration? It's the, I mean, I think either way we do it, it kind of ends up being the same favorites. Nice. Yeah. And I, I think part of it is is some of them have a lot of audience interaction. We have we pull up audience members and make them play characters too. And some of them have a lot of audience interaction that always goes off really well. So I think that's part of it too. What does your tattoo say? It says a uh, beautiful light is born of darkness. <sighs> Um, okay, so if you are near Southern California, August 18th, you said? Yes. That's very convenient because this is airing on August 7th. So that gives y'all time to get your tickets and go to, did you say Bria? Bria, California? Uh, Brea. But yeah, probably spelled the same. B-R-E-A. Okay. Brea. Brea. Yeah. Um, fabulous. Do you have any advice for anyone who wants to make an ensemble show? I think one of the things that helped me was that I knew what I was making it for. I didn't just make a show. I had a reason I was making it and I had an end goal for where I wanted it to be and like the stage that I saw it on. Mm -hmm. Um. I think that helped instead of just writing a show and hoping it got made. It was I had a really clear, <laughs> yeah, I had a really clear goal in mind. Doing Fringe also really helped us uh, because you get, I mean, at least for us now we have this little like award thing that we can put everywhere on all of our materials, we also had, a, we were able to build a press kit just from doing Fringe to to be able to send out and submit um, at some of the bigger festivals. There's also a lot of press, so you'll get reviews and you'll get feedback from the show and all of that's kind of built in. So it does help. Um, I think doing Fringe helped us a lot instead of just trying to get into Renaissance fairs right away. Right. It helped, like, it was a turnkey way to get your press kit really filled out. Yeah. With reviews and everything. Awesome. Uh, do you have any advice for, I, I get a lot of messages from people who would love to work for the Ren Fair. Really? Yes. <laughs> well, what I've been told, we we got really lucky with the few that we've got so far because it was just, I had a press kit and sent it and it has, I mean, you could even put that in the show notes if you want people to see what people are looking for, but it's like a couple of videos and bios and a synopsis of the show um, and then like your your rates and everything too. What I've been told a lot from other people that have been doing this longer than us is you just have to be, you have to be kind of annoying. Like you have to email and then follow up and then call and email again and send things out early, like a year in advance and, and keep, keep on it and keep bothering people. Yeah. I'm, I'm totally dancing on camera because this is just music to my ears. <laughs> it's so validating uh, to, to hear because I do believe in, in being annoying or at least not being afraid of being annoying yeah. and uh, people mm-hmm. be being afraid of being annoying. And I get it that it's usually women 
and they, they don't want to bother mm-hmm. people, but you gotta. Yeah. You gotta bother people. Yeah. And thank you for saying that about the press kit. If it's, uh, if you're cool with that, I will definitely link your press kit in the show notes so people can see how the sausage is made. Yeah, of course. I was going to make a note of that, but I don't really need to make a note, do I? Because I'm going to hear this recording back. <laughs> yeah. So um, what's next for you after the playwright, the female playwrights festival in August? What are your sights set on? Well, we're going to keep um, submitting to festivals with 79, uh, but we have a couple other things, projects that we want to get going. Um, I finally wrote that one woman show that I was like, fuck, I need to write a one woman show. (laughs) So I did it. Um, And so the goal is to submit it to French festivals for 2025. And then we have an idea for like a a YouTube series that we're going to start working on too. Tell me about your one woman show. Well, it's still Shakespeare related. Uh It's not funny though anymore. It's called Ophelia is going to drown. (laughs) And it's the story of Hamlet from Ophelia's perspective. Um, It deals with a lot of heavy topics like abuse and suicide and um, she spends a lot of time talking about the other female characters and the way they were um, treated in in the shows and how, like, especially the characters that all died off stage and, and how they've been ignored for these male characters, even though they're clearly the more interesting characters. Well, they didn't even get to die on stage. Yeah. So how many times do you die in 79 ways? I die one time. Um, The two clowns do all the dying. I see. Okay. So do you just die at the end then? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, what about the fourth cast member? When does he die? Does he die? He also dies just one time. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to know more, go see the show. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I was really excited uh, to to bring you on on because I like bringing people on the podcast who are making new things and pushing the boundaries of uh, of their disciplines. And I also wanted to bring you on because you've changed your life so massively in lots of ways since I've known you. You know, me and Veronica have never actually met. Like many people that yeah. I know and love, never met in person. Not sure if we ever will, although it seems kind of likely that we will eventually. But uh, can you tell us about, because you're also an aerialist and a coach. Yeah. Sort of, yeah. But that relationship (laughs) has changed massively uh, because of uh, a rigging failure that led to a significant injury on your part in October of last year. And I know there are a lot of people listening who have had similar experiences. And I've said what I know to say about it. But in your estimation, how do you cope with the grief of losing that relationship and having to change it, not getting a choice in the matter? Like your relationship with this thing, it's now different. I found a lot of other things to do instead of being, if instead of like, I mean, there was plenty of like going to the gym and then sitting in my car and crying. Um, (laughs) But also like I picked up photography and I went back to school and I was like, well, we need somebody to do marketing and PR. So I guess I'll go take some classes. (laughs) And then we were, we also was, I was working on the show. Um, so there were a lot of other things. We we had a show. I I my accident was in early October, and then we had a a show in December. Mm, and, that's fast. Yeah. So yeah. we had like we started having pickup rehearsals in November, and it was so strange because like that 
month of October, I didn't realize until we had our first rehearsal that I was like, oh my God, I haven't even seen anybody that I don't live with in a month. I thought, thank God we're doing this show. I don't know what I would do. I'd lose my mind. Um, so I, yeah, I had a lot of other things to to put focus on and, and find things to put focus on uh, so that I wasn't just crying in my car outside of the gym. Yeah. When you say gym, do you mean aerial gym? No, like I, mm-hmm. I was doing PT and they gave mm-hmm. me exercises to go do it. Yeah. Oh, yes. That period of time. Yeah. It seems to go on and on. Is there anything that you would uh, that you would offer to someone other than like find a lot of things to do? But like you're getting your strength back now. I was, um, you know, I was watching from afar and seeing you get back into the air. I thought like from my perspective it happened much faster than i thought that it would um, cuz i only have me to go off of and i take things um yeah you know extraordinarily slowly but you did get back into uh, the air i did i didn't know if i ever would um and i think the only reason that i got back so quickly was because it's part of my income and I needed to keep making money. So I went back to coaching like in January. So, and it's, I've been slowly, like I went back to just working with my kids that I coach in January. And then a couple months later, I went back to like teaching like one or two classes at like the adult studio that I work at and like slowly, kind of slowly ramping back up but I don't I don't think I would have gone to it back to it so quickly if I didn't need to if you yeah if you didn't have to yes yeah do you think you would have gone back to it at all I don't know I mean I so my main apparatus before was rope and that's not I fell on a hammock Mm -hmm. Um, but I went back to like hammock and silks first because that's what I was coaching. Nobody cares about learning rope in LA, sadly. (laughs) Interesting. Um, (laughs) So I didn't have to, I didn't have to learn it. I didn't have to get back on rope. Um, and I did recently, I've started getting back on it recently because I really missed it. So I don't know. I, maybe I would have eventually like missed it and decided to come back, um, but also, I've heard of so many injuries recently, and every time I'm like, "Why did I? Why am I still doing this? Why, why did I decide to start doing this again?" We're all <laughs> mad here. Yeah, you know, there's something different about. Um, well, I don't know. I I haven't had a thousand careers. I've only had one. But. For some reason, when it comes to being an aerialist, any change to that relationship cuts so deep. And it's not like, I don't know, I don't know what kind of uh, connection I want to draw because I was going to say it's not like being an accountant, but I don't know anything about being an accountant because I haven't been one. I just know that when you define yourself by this discipline, and like pour everything into it. And then the, the relationship changes. It, it shatters you. Or it shattered yeah. me. Yeah. And it's happened like five times. So. I think I'm. I'm really glad that it's not the only thing that defines me anymore. Because for a while it was. And I, I didn't know who I was without. Being an aerialist. And then. Um, I think that that started to change as the theater company was growing and the show was growing. So I was kind of already in that process. Um, I think the hardest part about coming back is like, I can't do anything anymore. <sighs> like, it's really depressing to like get up to train and remember things that were 
so easy that you could just do over and over and over without thinking and you can't do them at all anymore. That's the hardest part. It makes it really hard to, for me to convince myself to, to go train when it's just very discouraging. But you did. Yeah. How were you able to do that? Because I missed, I I miss it. I miss mm. Yeah. Being up there and love. Yeah. Stupidity. Love's a bitch. <laughs> it, gets, it gets you just gets you by the balls and won't let go. It's not fun to talk about, but I just think you're so inspiring and um been wanting to catch up with you for a while, uh watching from afar. So thank you for sharing your insight. With me and with all of us, the people who are silently listening in the background, is there, uh, what's the best place for people to learn more about you? I, for about me specifically, I guess, Instagram. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I try to post on there pretty frequently. There's not a lot of Ariel on there anymore, though. <laughs> it's, it's mostly the show and then sometimes... <laughs> It it's Maybe a thing so. that unites a lot of us, but it's not the it's not the main dish. Yeah, it, not to me. So no one cares if there's not Ariel on there. <laughs> Want to go <laughs> anyway? <laughs> there was one more question that I wanted to ask you. Um, is there someone who has impacted your artistic career, which I know encompasses a great deal of many things? Who's had like a significant positive impact on you? Um, I mean, there's a few. Well, one would be like my high school theater teacher. She, I, I wrote things in in high school that she let us perform, uh, which is like I don't know why she was like, yeah, she you know, just makes stuff. Um, <laughs> That's so cool. So, yeah, that and then honestly, as I was going through all of this process and like all of those roadblocks coming up, you were one of the people that I heard in my head that like Aww. made me keep going. I'm honored. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't expect you to say that. Yeah. I'm hiding in a coffee cup now. <laughs> <laughs> I think this show when I did the audacity project I think this show was when you were asking about like what's the one thing what's it was thing? for me it was this show yeah and then you did it yeah and then you made another one mm -hmm. when is uh Ophelia is going to drown when when is that gonna set to premiere 2025 you said Yes. Have you chosen so, a stage? Where I'm just submitted to San Diego Fringe. Their uh, submissions opened a couple days ago. Uh, so I submitted to that. And then when Hollywood Fringe submissions open, we're going to submit to that as well. Amazing. Yeah, you don't even have to get on a plane. I know. <laughs> just work at home. It's one of the benefits of living in LA. Yeah. Well, the goal is, one of the reasons that I was like, oh, I need a one-person show, was that I looked at our show, and I looked at the one-person shows, and we have four cast members on this huge set, and there are um, exchange programs where they send people like overseas to do fringes, but it was all the one-person shows with one person, and no props to carry around and I was like oh that's that's what I need to do <laughs> wow so that's what I yeah well yeah it just seems very tidy mm -hmm. I can see the appeal yeah you've got my brain turning thank you mm -hmm. for making my brain churn <laughs> hey, is there uh well is there any last thing that you want to share with the people before we let them go just do what you want to do even if people don't think you should do it or don't believe in you. Just keep doing it. I support this message. <laughs>
Thank you so much, Veronica. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Okay, my good people, I just wanted to hop on here and say thank you for letting us talk into your ear for almost an hour. And that if you have requests for guests or future podcast episodes, I'd love to hear them. I always love hearing from you. You can reach me on Instagram at Rachel Strickland Creative or on Patreon at Rachel Strickland Creative. This podcast is powered by Patreon, so extra special shout out to my patrons for making this and so much more possible for me. Thank you for standing with me. And if you do want to come tomorrow to learn how to get bomb-ass artist residencies and maybe make your own shows, then check the show notes and don't go back to sleep.